Hi, my name is Katie Connor. I've been working in PA education for about 10 years now. I'm also an orthopedic surgery PA in Charleston, South Carolina. Today, we're going to be talking about the genitourinary and the renal objectives. This is part of our 13-part series to help make didactic ear just a little bit easier and help you to ace your boards. So let's look at our objectives for this unit. Remember that our female genitourinary complaints are gonna be housed in our women's health and our reproductive lecture. So today we're gonna to focus on male genitourinary complaints in addition to all of our other renal disorders. So let's start out with some of our genitourinary cancers. I wanna make an important point before we get started here that you're gonna see smoking is a risk factor for a lot of these genitourinary cancers, which doesn't sound like it should be, but it's true, and when you think about it, the kidneys filter out all of the toxins from our blood and smoking increases the toxins in our blood. As those toxins are filtered out, they're then stored in the bladder before we get rid of them. So that's why smoking is gonna be a huge risk factor for renal and bladder cancers. The key point on bladder cancer is gonna be painless hematuria. That's very important, painless hematuria. The patient is going to present to you with, uh, with blood in their urine, be very concerned about that, but they will not have pain. Another interesting point about this history is this patient may have had bladder infections that they've been self-diagnosing that have been refractory to treatment. So they've done an antibiotic, then they've done another antibiotic and they're not getting better. And the reason is, they're having those irritative symptoms because of the bladder cancer, not because they have an infection. Physical exam on this is going to be really normal. You're not gonna feel anything unless this is advanced and then you may feel a super pubic mass, but typically no physical exam findings on this one. 80% of your bladder cancers are gonna be caused by environmental toxins and smoking being, being the biggest one of that. You have a six times increased risk for bladder cancer if you're a smoker. Other things that may cause this, solvents, exhaust, petroleum, dyes, organic chemicals. And this is where we're looking at that patient's career. What do they do for a living? Are they chronically exposed to these chemicals? Schistomes are parasitic flatworms that you would see in third world countries. So this is not gonna be a United States cause of bladder cancer. This would be a third world country. These parasitic flatworms cause chronic irritation and inflammation in the lining of the bladder, and so it increases cellular turnover and puts them at higher risk for bladder cancer. Here's a good exam question. 90% of your bladder cancers are gonna be transitional cell in nature because we know that's the main cell that makes up the bladder. If it's an adenocarcinoma, that's not a primary bladder cancer. That is usually gonna be a metastasis from another cancer and intestinal would be the most common in that, in that area. So epidemiology, that's where those careers and those jobs come up. Smokers, dry cleaners, bus and truck drivers who are exposed to exhausts and petroleum, hairdressers, mechanics, rubber and leather processors. We know that these people are very high risk because of the chronic exposure to those chemicals. On your analysis, you may see anywhere from trace to gross hematuria, depending on how big that cancer is. Remember that cancer bleeds. Cancers bleed, that's kind of a good general rule because they have a good supply of blood. That's how they grow. And so cancers are always something that we think about. Cancer should bleed. On urine cytology, this is more of a microscopic examination of the voided cells, and it's only gonna be accurate for our high-grade tumors. So this is not a screening test for bladder cancer. Cystoscopy plus biopsy is going to be your exam answer question. That is the most definitive test for bladder cancer because not only are you looking at it, you're also getting a cellular level, a way to look at that cell and figure out exactly, is it adenocarcinoma? Is it transitional cell? Is it a normal cell? What's going on? And you're getting that on a microscopic level. This is gonna be true for all the cancers we'll talk about today. CT, ultrasound, PET for staging, PET scan is gonna be for staging, but those can also be helpful imaging tools for us. It really depends on the stage for bladder cancer on how we treat it. You can go in and do a transurethral resection of that tumor and then put chemotherapy actually into the bladder. You can do a radical cystectomy where you take out the bladder or you can use targeted radiation in that area. A word called neobladder, I want you to be aware of in case you see it in the patient's chart or in case it's asked on the exam. This is where they do a surgical reconstruction of a bladder that's been completely removed. And that's an abdominal pelvic surgery where they use a flap to reconstruct that bladder. You need to monitor these patients because there's a high recurrence rate. 80% of your bladder cancers will recur. So that is why we need routine monitoring on these patients. 
Our next cancer is gonna be prostate cancer. This is a very common cancer. In fact, it is the most common male cancer and it is an older age at diagnosis, about 60 to 70 years old. They're gonna present with a lot of the same symptoms that you might have if you have BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. So urinary frequency, difficulty initiating the urination, urinary retention, they feel like they really haven't gotten their bladder uh, empty, weak stream and hematuria, but hematuria will not be present in BPH. Remember, cancer bleeds. If they have metastasis, this is most likely to metastasize to the bones. So in a later stage of prostate cancer, they may also complain of bone pain, but that's not going to be a primary complaint. So think irritative voiding symptoms plus hematuria is concerning for this. Here's another really commonly asked exam question. The digital rectal exam, where you are actually examining the prostate, what does that prostate feel like? And in cancer, it's going to be asymmetrical or you may feel a lump. That's an important point and that's commonly asked on exams. This is a slowly progressive adenocarcinoma. And I say slowly in the fact that prostate cancer itself unless it's a very aggressive form, is not usually the cause of death. A lot of times these people outlive their prostate cancer, but they end up dying from other comorbidities. As I mentioned, the metastasis to the bones, so pelvis, ribs, vertebra in that area. Most common male cancer, very advanced at age, usually 60 to 70, are risk factors, obesity, elevated testosterone, so if they're taking in exogenous testosterone, like a supplement, Agent orange exposure. This would only really be in Vietnam veterans. This is something that they were exposed to while they were in Vietnam, and we know that it definitely increases the risk. It's linked to prostate cancer. We're going to screen for this cancer with an annual digital rectal exam starting at age 50. We can also use something called PSA or prostate specific antigen. This is a blood test, and we're not looking for just the number. We're really looking for trending. As males get older, that prostate naturally increases the BPH due to the lack of testosterone. So you should see this kind of gradual increase in the PSA. What we get concerned about is all of a sudden you get a shoot up of that PSA, that's concerning, or if the PSA is very, very high. We know that somebody who has a PSA of about four to 10 has about a 25% likelihood of having this cancer. And anybody with a PSA over 10 has about a 50% likelihood. So it's not a slam dunk, but it is a good screening tool. And as a clinical point here, we're using that more for trending. Transrectal ultrasound and needle biopsy, that's the top picture that you can see there. That is the most definitive test because you're getting a look at it and you're able to take that on a cellular structure so that you can analyze that. The Gleason score is something you may be asked about. The Gleason score is what we use to predict based on that histopathology of that biopsy, how aggressive is this cancer and what is the patient's prognosis? And that's gonna be really important because this is one of those cancers that we don't always treat. We say we can observe it. So that Gleason score helps us determine how this cancer is going to behave. CT, MRI, PET scan, true for all of these that we're talking about here. Active surveillance is an option if this patient is 70 years or older, they have lots of other comorbidities, and it's going to be a low-grade dysplasia because the 15-year the 15 year survival rate for this is 96%. So at 70, with, with a lot of co other comorbidities and a low-grade dysplasia, this is not going to be what kills that patient. We can also use androgen deprivation therapy. We know that this is a type of cancer that grows in response to testosterone. So if we block the testosterone, we slow the growth of the cancer. If it's a cancer that comes back with high grade dysplasia, we can use radioactive seeds that are implanted into the prostate. You can do a radical prostatectomy where you take everything out, targeted radiation, and then chemotherapy if there's metastasis there. But there are risks of the treatment for this. So things like erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence, and that's really a quality of life issue for that patient. So you don't want to potentially make them worse and have a worse quality of life by doing a treatment for this prostate cancer. So it very much depends on that histopathology. Like I said, a 96% 15-year survival for non-metastatic but in the more aggressive forms, it's a 30% five-year survival if we're either metastatic or a very aggressive form. 
Renal cell carcinoma. Renal cell carcinoma is going to be, again, highly correlated with smoking. That's actually 33% of cases here. Renal cell carcinoma is asymptomatic until it's advanced. Once it's advanced, we get a triad. And we know anytime we see a triad, we're going to get asked an exam question on it. But this is actually only present in about 10% of patients. And our triad is flank pain, flank mass, and painless hematuria, because remember, cancer bleeds. But that's only 10%, and that's only if it's advanced. If it's advanced and they're metastatic now, you may get those secondary symptoms. We call them B symptoms of cancer, night sweats, weight loss, loss of appetite. On physical exam, only if it's advanced, you may feel a flank mass. They may have an abdominal brewy. Remember, a brewy is when you hear a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh going through a vessel. And that means that vessel is somehow occluded and smaller. And that's because that cancer can be pushing on that renal vessel. That renal vessel. New onset of hypertension. If you remember from cardiology that the most common cause of secondary hypertension is renal artery stenosis. Something that stenosis, the renal artery, could be a cancer. So you'd have a new onset of hypertension because the body is trying to perfuse that blood into the kidney as, as well as it can through a smaller straw. Left-sided varicocele. Varicocele looks like a bag of worms, and we'll talk about this. It's a dilation in the pampiniform plexus. And the reason you would get a left-sided renal uh, varicocele with a renal cell carcinoma, look down at the bottom here in this anatomy chart. Remember that the left testicular vein is directly associated with the left renal vein, whereas the right testicular vein drains into the IVC. So if you have an issue or a mass that's occluding the right renal vein, it's not going to matter because it's already in the IVC. So remember, left renal vein goes directly to the left testicular vein. And if you have a backup from that area, it will push and cause a dilation of the pampiniform plexus. Smoking, like I said, is 33% of the cause environmental toxins as well. So think about the careers that are exposed to this, industrial solvents, petroleum, herbicides. There's an unknown mechanism that also links obesity with an increased risk for renal cell carcinoma. Patients who have polycystic kidney disease that we'll talk about a little later on also have a higher risk for this because they have a higher rate of cellular turnover. Here's another good exam question. 80% of your renal cell carcinomas occur in the renal cortex and 75% histologically are clear cells. So that's good exam questions there. Renal cortex and clear cells. This is usually an older age of a diagnosis, so 60s and older. On your analysis, cancer bleeds. So we may see gross hematuria. We may also see a hypercalcemia. And I know this isn't our endocrine unit, but in a hypercalcemia, what can happen is that renal cells secrete something called parathyroid-related peptide, which acts like parathyroid, which if you remember, parathyroid chews up the bones, releases calcium into the bloodstream. So you can get a hypercalcemia with renal cell carcinoma. On CT, this is going to be our definitive test for this one, and then a PET scan for staging. Really depending on where we are in the stage, surgical resection is definitive if we can take it out. Radio frequency ablation, if it's a very small tumor and they're a non-surgical candidate, let's say they have you know, very serious heart or lung issues. If it's metastatic, chemotherapy, the first place for this to metastasize to is gonna be the lungs. And then we see the adrenal glands, the liver and bone. Next, we're gonna talk about testicular cancer. Remember we said prostate cancer is the most common male cancer and that's usually 60 at the age of diagnosis. Testicular cancer is one of the few cancers that affects younger men. You really kind of see this dichotomy of distribution for this one. So the most common age is going to be ages 15 to 35. It's a younger man's cancer. You can also have this surge again at age 60, but I want you to focus on the 15 to 35. In testicular cancer, about 50% of these is going to be something called, we call a pure seminoma. And that's gonna be the one that they ask you on the question because that's the majority of these. The patient is going to present with this painless scrotal mass. He may say that he has some groin heaviness, but that's not super specific. If this tumor secretes HCG, which we know is our pregnancy hormone, they can also develop a secondary gynecomastia, which is breast tissue in men. That's kind of female shaped. On physical exam, this is a really important point here because this is a commonly tested question. It is a non-tender 
firm mass that cannot be separated from the testes because the epididymis can kind of be separated away from the testes. So this mass is non-separable from the testes. We talked about pure seminoma. That's the most common cause. You can also have non-seminomas and the choriocarcinoma is gonna be the most aggressive form of these. Embryonal carcinoma, yolk sac tumor and teratoma are other causes. Risk factors are really important on this one too. Somebody who's had a prior testicular cancer on the contralateral side has a 500 times risk of developing it, developing it on, the, on the other side. So contralateral side, the other side. Cryptorchidism, which is a failure to descend of the testes, that puts them at eight times risk. So that's a good thing to ask about in the history. Kleinfelter, which we know is a genetic syndrome of XXY, puts them at six times the risk. Down syndrome, Agent Orange exposure, that's where you're seeing that kind of dichotomy in the 60s for this one. Caucasians are going to be our most common ethnic group on this one, but again, think 15 to 35 regardless of their ethnicity. Screening for this is very important. Just like we tell women to do self-screening for breast exams, we want men to be doing testicular exams, so doing a self-exam. During your sports physicals, this is one thing that we'll be checking for as well as a provider. Beta HCG and LDH may be positive in your seminomas and non-seminomas. Remember the HCG is that pregnancy hormone. LDH is lactase dehydrogenase. And we know that that is released in response to cellular breakdown. If you remember from our hematology lecture, we said that most of our hemolytic anemias are gonna have an LDH. Well, this one is not due to cellular breakdown. It's because the chromosomal mutation for uh, testicular cancer is chromosome 12. Defects in lactase dehydrogenase are also on chromosome 12. So that's just because it shares a defective chromosome 12. Alpha fetoprotein, this may be another exam question that you see. Alpha fetoprotein is a tumor marker that will be positive in non-seminomas only, but that's an important one. Ultrasound is gonna be our initial screening test. You always wanna ultrasound. If there's any question at all, ultrasound. It's a cheap test. It's a fast test. There's no radiation there. And that will give you a definitive look at that area and that mass. So our ultrasound is our initial screening test. Our CT scan is our definitive test. And one of the characteristics that we may see on CT scan is something called microlithiasis, which are little tiny sprinkles of calcium within that mass. That's concerning for malignancy. Treatment for this, we can do, if they're young, we can do sperm banking so that they can have children later on. But an inguinal orchectomy where you're taking out those testicles and you want to do both sides, remember, because of the risk factor for the other side getting this. You'll do a lymph node dissection, figuring out where that sentinel node is, radiation and chemotherapy. There are options for a cosmetic prosthesis just to kind of help emotionally with this type of cancer, and then sperm banking if these are removed. This has an excellent prognosis, a five-year survival rate of 95% because it's usually younger, healthy men, and it's discovered usually pretty early on. Nephroblastoma or Wilms tumor. This is a genetic alteration in the embryonic renal, blastosternal, stromal, and epithelial cells. So kind of to simplify that, it's a genetic defect in the cells that make up the kidney, and this happens during development. This will present as a painless abdominal mass, and that's only as it's getting bigger. If the abdominal mass is large enough, they may get abdominal pain because it's pushing against other organs, but typically this is gonna be a painless abdominal mass. We may also see hematuria because cancer bleeds. So in the children where this is advanced, an abdominal mass, hypertension because you develop that renal artery obstruction, and you can see that. This is highly associated with cryptorchidism, horseshoe kidney, and hypospadias. These are all different anatomical defects that are associated with this genetic alteration and put them at higher risk for this. This is the most common pediatric malignant tumor, and the average age of diagnosis is about three and a half years old. That's very important. So most common pediatric malignant tumor and three and a half years old. This is more common in the ethnicity with African-Americans, but this can happen in any ethnicity. On your analysis, we may see that hematuria because cancer bleeds. Genetic studies will help us to figure out, is this, do they have that genetic mutation on the chromosome 11? An ultrasound is a good initial test because there's no radiation, it's cheap, it's fast. CT and MRI would be definitive for surgical planning and for staging. Treatment for this is to take out the tumor. 
Chemo radiation will come secondary to this, but there's a 90% survival rate if this is caught early. So that's why those pediatric well checks are so important. That was all of our genitourinary cancers. So now let's go through our male genitourinary disorders. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're gonna start out with hypospadias and epispadias. Let's look at the pictures first. Hypospadias is when the urethral meatus is on the ventral penile shaft. Epispadias is when it's on the dorsal penile shaft. So in history for this, this is really a physical exam diagnosis, but they may say that they have a split urine stream. Why? Because the urine's coming out of two openings. The urethral meatus on the ventral, ventral penile shaft and a cordy, which is ventral shortening, the penile head is pointed down and there's a curvature to it. That's hypospadias. So for your exam, they may ever either give you this picture or they may describe it to you this way, urethral meatus on the ventral penile shaft and then they also have this other anatomic abnormality for this. On epispadias, look at this bo bottom picture here. This is highly associated with something called a bifid penis where you actually have two, everything split. It's also associated with bladder exotrophy where the bladder is exposed ex externally as that child is born. So it's associated with other forms of anatomical defects. So this is the urethral meatus on the dorsal penile shaft. Etiology for this, we know it's a congenital development disorder, and it's usually due to decreased in utero testosterone exposure. If the, if the mom had in vitro fertilization and she has to have high levels of progesterone, this can also increase the risk for these anatomical defects. So the hypospadias and the epispadias. Hypospadias is much more common than epispadias. So one in 250 births versus one in 120,000 births. This is a clinical diagnosis, and this is going to be a surgical fixation for this. So a urethroplasty and a penile reconstruction at about six to 12 months old for that. Pathologic phimosis and paraphimosis. So let's look at the pictures first. Phimosis is where you cannot retract the foreskin proximally over the glands. Paraphimosis is then you cannot retract the foreskin distally. And so they get this kind of flaccid shaft and an edematous glands penis. The only history on this may be a painful erection, but this may be absolutely asymptomatic as well. Phimosis can be physiologic, meaning it can be very normal. This is very normal in kids. And those adhesions that are holding that, are holding that um, foreskin, they start to dissolve with age. So this can self-resolve in children. Instead of being physiologic, which is normal, it can also be pathologic. This is where they develop this constrictive foreskin because they've had recurrent balanitis, which we'll talk about in a few minutes here. But balanitis causes scar tissue. And so it can scar that foreskin and cause adhesions between the foreskin and the penis. And then that foreskin does not move back properly. In paraphimosis, this one is emergent because it can compromise the blood flow. So this is impairment of venous and lymphatic flow, and this can lead to arterial compromise. This one is an emergency. This one is usually due to vigorous sex, penile piercings, catheter use, or chronic balanitis. So paraphimosis is much more of an emergent condition than phimosis is. Who do we usually see this in? People with poor hygiene. Why? Because they're at increased risk for balanitis. And we know that balanitis is the cause for a lot of these. Uncircumcised, obviously, because they still have the foreskin. Elderly are also at higher risk for this because they develop a loss of skin elasticity and they don't have erections supposedly as frequent. But now remember that the highest rate of STDs is now in elderly people. So that's not necessarily 100% true. But um, infrequent erections and loss of skin elasticity can cause that skin to become more scarred. Phimosis is mostly non-urgent. Topical steroids can, it can cause skin atrophy and reduce inflammatory process. So that can be a treatment. Paraphimosis is an emergent condition. Why? Because of the arterial compromise. So we can try manual reduction of the foreskin using ice or osmotic dextrose to kind of shrink that skin so that it can be reducible. Punctures in the glands, aspiration, dorsal slits, and circumcisions. That's kind of the pathway in severity and, and how invasive those treatments are, but it is very important to fix this. Otherwise, you have arterial compromise, which we know causes ischemia. Scrotal hydrocele, hydro meaning water, water in the testes. 
This is usually due, in children at least, into an open process vag processes vaginalis that communicates with the abdominal cavity and it allows peritoneal fluid to collect in the scrotum. That's the most common cause. In third world countries, filariad worms can block up the lymphatic system. And so they're kind of causing the same thing. So they're causing this backup of lymphatic fluid into the scrotum. And that's gonna be more third world countries, but most commonly this is gonna be pediatrics due to that anatomical defect in the processes vaginalis. If somebody has a new onset of scrotal hydrocele as an adult, this can be post-traumatic, post-viral infection, or a teratoma testicular cancer can cause a scrotal hydrocele. So we don't want to not think about testicular cancer on this one. We want to keep that in our differential, although it's not that common. They're going to present with a feeling of scrotal fullness. And on physical exam, you're going to see that they have a non-tender scrotum that's filled with fluid. It transilluminates homogeneously. And as they stand up or they valsalva, that increases that fluid going into that scrotal hydrocele. So it may enlarge with those two positions. 90% of this is gonna be male infants and only 6% remains past infancy once that, that defect is fixed. Ultrasound is gonna be our diagnostic for this. Remember, this is also our screening tool for that testicular cancer. This typically self-resolves like we talked about in those male infants. They can do a surgical repair of the tunica vaginalis if it's persistent past about age two, but this is mostly a self-resolving condition in kids. Varicocele, I mentioned this one earlier. In varicocele, this is a dilation of that pampiniform plexus and the spermatic vein. So look at that bottom picture real quick there. That's the anatomy of what we're looking at. So a dilation of the pampiniform plexus and the spermatic vein. Basically, you're getting varicose veins in the scrotum. So that, was, that will feel like a bag of worms. That is something that you will get described on that exam question is a palpable bag of worms. Most of this is completely asymptomatic. And the only reason they find it is because of an infertility workup, because this is highly correlated with infertility. About 40% of infertile males have this as the cause. Some men may report a dull aching in the scrotum that improves as their supine, because again, it's kind of like varicose veins, like I mentioned, and we know that those will get better as we elevate them. So palpable bag of worms, we talked about that. 20% of all males have this and 40% of all infertile males, because it interferes with the thermoregulation of the sperm. So the sperm either become overcooked or undercooked, and then they're not functional. This is the most commonly surgically correctable, most common surgically correctable cause of infertility. On semen analysis, we may see oligospermia or sperm that are anatomically, morphologically bad. They're not functional. Ultrasound is gonna be our diagnostic test for this because that's gonna show the vessels. And then finally, surgery is the, is the treatment for this because we talked about this being a surgically correctable cause. Next, we have cryptorchidism, which I also talked about. Cryptorchidism is a failure to descend of the testes into the scrotum. This is highly genetic, so it's correlated with a family history of cryptorchidism. That's about 25% of cases. It's also correlated with maternal alcohol use. That puts them at about a three times risk or maternal smoking. On physical exam for this, you're going to have the patient sit cross leg because that forces the testes down into the scrotum. So have the patient sit cross leg and you cannot palpate the testes in the scrotum when they're in that position. That's your physical diagnosis for this. 66%, so two thirds are gonna be unilateral and one third are gonna be bilateral. The reason this occurs is something called the gubernaculum. And you can see on this picture here, the gubernaculum is what pulls the testes into the scrotum during normal development. So in this case, it's either not firmly attached um, it's not, in this case, it's not firmly attached and it does not cause that descent down into the scrotum. The testes may be located in the inguinal canal, the femoral canal, the opposite scrotum, and the perineum. Those are all the places that it can go to instead. Other risk factors besides maternal, al maternal alcohol and smoking would be prematurity, low birth weight, twinning, and maternal exposure to estrogen within the first trimester. So we know those are other risk factors. This is very common. 3% of full-term males and 30% of premature males have this. Clinical diagnosis, like we talked about, sit cross leg and you're palpating that testes. And ultrasound is only ordered if it's questionable. 
hormones can help to present the descent only if it's a distal, if it's close to where it's supposed to be. There's only about a 20% efficacy for this, and that can be HCG and gonadotropin releasing hormone. Orcopexy is our surgical fixation for this after the age of six months old. That's going to be a definitive treatment. If we don't treat this, it puts them at a higher risk for testicular cancer, like we talked about. That's a 40 times risk testicular torsion and infertility. So this is something we wanna to treat to avoid those. Next, we have urethritis. We've talked about this in almost every single unit, I feel like, gonorrhea, chlamydia. So in ureth urethritis, this is a common thing that we see in STDs or STIs. 80% of people are asymptomatic, but those who are symptomatic may complain about painful urination, discharge from the meatus, painful ejaculation, hematuria, and some history of unprotected intercourse within the last two weeks, because that's where they get this. On physical exam, a mucopurulent discharge, so a purulent kind of thicker discharge, chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea, most common causative agents. This can be transmitted during anal or, oral, or, anal or vaginal intercourse. You can still get it with oral. It is very rare. Chlamydia incubation is about one to three weeks. Gonorrhea incubation is about two to seven days. However, uh, uh, chlamydia is much, much more common than gonorrhea. It's three times, in fact, more common. And so when you think about that, they have this longer incubation period. So if they're, not, they're having unprotected sex, they're transmitting it to all these people without knowing it. So if the symptoms don't show up for a while, it's much more common because it's spread more commonly because people don't realize that they have it. Men who have sex with men, not because they're just men who have sex with men, but they are less likely to use barrier contraception because a man can't get another man pregnant. So it has nothing to do with just men having sex with men, but they are a higher risk group for not using barrier contraception. Other prior STIs, multiple partners, no barrier, protect, no barrier contraceptive use or barrier protection is a higher risk for this. Swab, or cult swab and culture, you can either do a, um, a urine culture or you can do a penile swab. You're going to send that off for analysis and that'll tell us exactly what it is. We don't want to wait to get the results of that to treat though. Doxycycline or azithromycin is our treatment of choice for chlamydia, but we always, always should cover for gonorrhea as well. So a shot of rocephin plus doxycycline or azithromycin treats both of these because that patient is not always likely to show back up to find out what the results of their culture was. Acute epididymitis. In this, you have a bacteria that refluxes from the prostatic urethra to the epididymis via the ejaculatory duct. So this is an infection that comes from elsewhere. This is an infection in the urine, that's where the bacteria is, that's deposited into the epididymis. History for this one, gradual unilateral scrotal pain that develops over days. And this is really important because epididymitis can sometimes be confusing for testicular torsion because both of them can cause pain in the scrotum, but testicular torsion is something you do not want to miss. So acute epididymitis is usually going to be days worth of pain, whereas testicular torsion is going to be hours of pain. They may also complain of dysuria. So erythematous, painful, indurated scrotum, that can also look like testicular torsion. Here's an important point I'm about to make here. There's something called the Pren sign. In the prenzyme, you're going to elevate the scrotum. If the pain stops or if the pain gets better, that tells us it's epididymitis or at least clues us into this. If you have torsion, even if you elevate the testes, the torsion is still there. Remember, ischemia is painful. So whether it's up or down, it doesn't matter. It's still ischemic, so it's still painful. So in epididymitis, you're taking the tension off of that inflamed epididymis and that helps with the pain. So we call this a positive Pren sign. That's really important. In epididymitis, they'll also have a normal cremasteric reflex. If you guys remember from anatomy, you stroke the inner thigh and the scrotum should elevate on that side. Fever may be present in 25% of patients because this is an infection. If this is due to an STI, they may also have that urethral discharge. So this is bacteria in the urine that refluxes from the prostatic urethra to the epididymis via the ejaculatory duct. So it's a whole form of anatomy there. You got to think your way through that. If it's less than age 35, there's kind of a, a, a split here. Less than age 35 and sexually active is usually going to be caused by chlamydia. 
over the age of 35 is usually going to be caused by E. coli. That's an important point, and it's a common exam question. So under 35, chlamydia. Over 35, E. coli. If you see weightlifters in the question, this is also a risk factor for this because as they're doing this strenuous exertion or Valsalva that worsens the urinary reflux in, from, into the epididymis. So weightlifters are a huge risk factor for this one. On your analysis, pyuria, white blood cells in the urine, gram stain that urethral discharge because we're, we gotta figure out what kind of cell is this? What kind of bacteria is this? Doppler ultrasound, you want to make sure that you're ruling out torsion. You will see an increased blood flow to the area in acute epididymitis. You will see a decrease or no blood flow to the area in testicular torsion, because remember that's ischemia. Treatment for this, scrotal elevation, ice, anti-inflammatories, and antibiotics. Again, if we can get that culture, that's great, because we can specifically treat this, but Rocephin, doxycycline, azithromycin, and leviquin are common treatments for this. Testicular torsion, I've been talking about that on the last slide. In testicular torsion, this is a torsion of the spermatic cord and, causing, and it causes ischemia to the testes. This is an acutely painful over hours type of presentation, whereas an epididymitis is kind of gradual pain over days. This can be related to direct trauma to the testes. So they have some kind of history of getting kicked in the groin or kicked in the scrotum, or it can be spontaneous. But on the history, this is important. Acute, severe, unilateral testicular pain that worsens over hours, not days. History of direct trauma. They may also have systemic symptoms like nausea or vomiting. On physical exam, edematous, erythematous scrotum. Sounds like epididymitis. Firm, tender testes that is higher than the contralateral testes. That's because it has spun. And so it's higher up than the other side. The pain is not relieved with elevation. We call that that negative Pren sign. And they'll also have a loss of the cremasteric reflex on that side. So these are important points to help us distinguish between epididymitis and testicular torsion. This is common in neonates and early teens. That's our two groups that we see this in. In neonates, the tunica vaginalis is not secured to the gubernaculum and it spins on itself. In early teens, they all of a sudden have an increased weight of the testes and an acute contraction of the cremasteric muscles. That's the pathophysiology that causes that in early teens. So think about neonates and early teens for this. Also anybody who's been kicked in the groin. Doppler ultrasound will be definitive for this. It will show us that the blood flow to the area is decreased or non-existent, AKA ischemia to the testes. This is a clinical diagnosis. Ma uh, manual, manual detorsion, when you grab the testes and try to spit it, that can help to try to relieve some of that ischemia and pain, but ultimately this must be a surgical detorsion because even if you manually detorse it, it still may come back. So a surgical detorsion within about six hours gives us the best chance to preserve that blood flow to the testes and not have ischemia. Orchitis. Orchitis, if you remember from our, um, our dermatology, or no, our infectious disease unit, this one is associated with mumps. So in orchitis, we get both testicular swelling and parotid swelling. In orchitis, most highly correlated with mumps, malaise, fever, onset of parotitis within about four to seven days prior than the orchitis. So the parotitis comes first, and then the testicular, uh, then, and then the orchitis. Testicular pain may also be described. This is a very painful condition if you have mumps. Testicular enlargement and tenderness, scrotal erythema, edema, and bilateral peritidis if we have mumps. Mumps, like I've said 15 times now, I feel like, is the most common, uh, most common cause of this, but you can also have a concurrent epididymitis. So it could be gonorrhea, E. coli, chlamydia causing any of that. Mumps, we think about preteens, unvaccinated people. If it's due to concurrent epididymitis, we think about a sexually active adult for that. Doppler ultrasound will show us peritesticular edema, increased blood flow to the area. And we're also doing this again to rule out that testicular torsion. We do not want to miss torsion. Concurrent epididymitis might be supported by your, your inflammatory markers that are kind of nonspecific. So your sed rate and your C-reactive protein. You'd also do a urethral culture if they have drainage from that area. 
If it's mumps, supportive care, it will self-resolve. So scrotal elevation, ice, anti-inflammatories. If you suspect that this could be due to chlamydia or gonorrhea, they have a mucopurulent urethral discharge, ceftriaxone, doxycycline. 60% of people who have orchitis will develop secondary infertility because you can develop testicular atrophy after you have this. So this is not just something to ignore. And they say, well, mumps is self-resolving. Yes, but there can be secondary complications and infertility is one of them. Prostatitis and chronic pelvic pain syndrome or CPPS. There's really three different types of these and I put them all on the same slide because I want you to learn them together. They all have very similar histories, uh, perineal or rectal pain, ejaculatory pain, erectile dysfunction, irritative urination. So things like dysuria, frequency, urgency. And then fever is only going to be present in acute prostatitis only. And that's gonna be an important point that I'll come back to. On digital rectal exam, here's a commonly tested board question. Tender, boggy prostate, that helps us th with this diagnosis. So digital rectal exam shows us a tender, boggy prostate. If it's due to an STI, they may also have that urethral discharge, but I want you to remember tender, boggy prostate on this one. The etiology of this, you get urine and the bacteria that's in the urine that refluxes from the prostatic urethra into the prostatic ducts. Then it sets up this beautiful area to get the secondary infection. Acute bacterial prostatitis, the way that we know this one is it has a fever. The most common agents, there's three of them, are going to be E. coli, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. There are other things, and sometimes this is polymicrobial, but those are the three most common causative agents for that one. For chronic bacterial prostatitis, this one does not have a fever because it's chronic. The most common causative agent for that one is going to be E. coli and symptoms need to be present for at least three months in order to establish this diagnosis. In CPPS, we don't know what causes this. The symptoms may last for years, and this one is very frustrating for the patient to have these kind of symptoms and not be able to nail down a diagnosis. Epidemiology, we talked about it. Over the age of 35 is usually gonna be E. coli. Under the age of 35 is gonna be chlamydia or gonorrhea. Same distribution for this one as epididymitis. In acute bacterial prostatitis, we're gonna run a urinalysis and that's gonna show leukocytes because it's an active infection. They may also have an elevated PSA and you wanna culture the urethral discharge if they have one because you're thinking STI for that one. Do not perform prostatic massage on acute bacterial prostatitis. That's a common board question and important for you to know clinically. If you perform prostatic massage, you may take that bacteria and make it systemic and now you've caused sepsis. So prostatic massage is contraindicated if the patient has a fever and they haven't had symptoms for three months. In chronic bacterial prostatitis, the urinalysis is not going to show leukocytes. They will have an elevated PSA and you can do the prostatic massage. You're going to do a culture for this and they may or may not have leukocytes. In chronic pelvic pain syndrome, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. The PSA is going to be normal. The urinalysis is going to be normal. The prostatic fluid cultures are going to be negative. There's going to be no leukocytes. Again, diagnosis of exclusion. In acute bacterial prostatitis, if it's a, a sexually transmitted infection, we want to do our rocephin, doxycycline, azithromycin. If it's negative for chlamydia and gonorrhea and it's E. coli, we can use our fluoroquinolones or Bactrim, and we want to treat them for about seven to 10 days. In chronic bacterial prostatitis, this is going to be a longer course of therapy, and it's usually going to be fluoroquinolones or Bactrim for about four to six weeks. We can also give them medications to help with those irritative voiding symptoms. So our alpha adrenergic antagonist, things like tam um, tamsulosin, anything that ends in osin, basically for those. We can also give them a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. That's another way that we can treat their irritative voiding symptoms. On CPPS, because it's a diagnosis of exclusion, there's no magic bullet to help treat this. And again, it's very frustrating for the patient. Pelvic floor relaxation techniques are alpha adrenergic antagonists that we use for um, chronic bacterial prostatitis can also be help with, helpful with those irritative voiding symptoms. Balanitis, I mentioned this a lot when we were talking about phimosis and paraphimosis. This is an, infl uh, an inflammatory process that happens because of an overgrowth of candida. And candida, remembers our fungus, it's our yeast. 
So pain with foreskin retraction, dysuria, and pruritus. Remember that fungal infections are itchy. So this should help clue you into this one. So itchy. Sore red erosions or plaques on the penis. So you can see that on both pictures here. And then smegma, which if you look at this top picture here, it's this kind of whitish collection of dead skin cells uh, that collects underneath the foreskin. Normally we're gonna see this in diabetics because it's a fungus and we know that diabetics are more likely to get fungal infections. People who are uncircumcised, poor hygiene and incontinence because it creates this chronically wet environment. And we know that fungus loves to grow in wet environments. Diagnostic criteria for this can be clinical, but a KOH prep is helpful to confirm that. Antifungal treatments, because it's an overgrowth of a fungus or a yeast, candida. So topical clotrimazole, fluconazole can be helpful for this one. If they have recurrent balanitis, that can cause scarring, which again, increases that risk for phimosis and paraphimosis. We talked about that on that slide. Benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH. This is gonna sound familiar when we first start talking about it because it has a lot of the symptoms of prostate cancer, except hematuria, and that's an important point. What happens here is the prostate grows and grows and grows because it's, if you have a decreased level of testosterone, the body tries to compensate for that by growing the prostate. So the prostate grows in response to decreased testosterone, and this happens with age. As that prostate grows, it pinches off the prostatic urethra. Look at that top picture there. We know that prostatic urethra is a part where the urethra comes out before it continues on. And if it's pinched off there, that can cause trouble emptying the bladder, which can cause symptoms like urinary frequency, urgency, hesitancy, which can include things like difficulty in initiating the urination, straining or weak stream, incomplete bladder emptying, dribbling and nocturia. They have to get up at night to pee. The physical exam for this is very important as well. The digital rectal exam is gonna show that you have a uniformly enlarged, non-tender, symmetrical, no mass, but uniformly enlarged, larger than two finger breadths is our diagnosis for that one. In addition to the prostatic hypertrophy, you can also get a detrusor hyperactivity that's secondary to this. So remember the detrusor muscle is what causes the bladder to contract. So you have a pinching off of the urethra and an overactive bladder. 33% of males over age 50, but 95% of males over the age of, age of 85. This is super, super common, especially in our older populations. If they present with these irritative urinary symptoms, we wanna do a urinalysis to rule out any kind of urinary tract infection. We wanna make sure they're not having hematuria, which remember is concerning for prostate cancer. Our PSA or our prostate specific antigen, remember we were talking about trending for that. So it may be slightly elevated or trending in a gradual direction, but you're not seeing this large spike. Transrectal ultrasound or a truss may be indicated if they have an abnormally elevated PSA or they've had a spike or they've had hematuria because we wanna make sure that we're not missing a prostate cancer there. Treatment can range. If they have mild symptoms, you can do things like observation. Saw palmetto extract is something that's sold over the counter. Limiting their evening fluids will help with the nocturia, limiting alcohol and limiting caffeine because those have a diuretic effect. If they have moderate symptoms, there's three classes of medications that we can use to treat this. The alpha adrenergic blocker, that's the OSIN, five alpha, alpha reductase inhibitors, those are the steroids, and phosphodiesterase five inhibitors, that would be to dolophil. Our severe symptoms, if we have such severe symptoms that it's interfering with the quality of life, we can do a TERP, which is a transurethral resection of the prostate using a laser, using microwave, using radio frequency. Those are all ways that we can do that. Or we do a transurethral needle ablation called a tuna. So we have a TERP and a tuna, and those are all ways to decrease or debulk the size of the prostate. Erectile dysfunction. I'm going to make an important point on this one. The most common cause by far of erectile dysfunction is psychogenic. So most important point and most common exam question on this one. By definition, erectile dysfunction is a patient who's unable to ob obtain or maintain an erection that's satisfactory for sexual function. Here's some really important points in the history. We got to figure out, is their anatomy working? That's the most important thing. So 
are they able to have an erection during masturbation? If the answer is yes, their plumbing and their anatomy works. Are they able to ha have an erection with other partners? Their anatomy works. Are they able to have an erection in the morning? Their anatomy works. So if their anatomy is working, we're thinking it's probably more of a psychogenic cause. On physical exam, because there's a lot of things that cause erectile dysfunction, you may see nothing. It may be completely normal, especially if it's psychogenic, but they may have possible Peyronie's disease. That's the top picture there. They get these scar plaques that form on the penis and they contract. And so they cause this abnormal anatomy. On digital rectal exam, we want to make sure that their prostate is normal. Hypertension. If they have hypertension, we need to be thinking about other things that could be causing this like vascular disorders. This could be secondary to that. Small testes indicate hypogonadism, which decreases testosterone, and that can be a cause for this as well. So like I said, psychogenic is the most common cause. Depression, performance anxiety, PTSD. Systemic or localized causes for this. Diabetes, hypertension, or excuse me, hypertension is in vascular. Diabetes hypogonadism, which causes low testosterone, prostatitis, alcoholism, Peyronie's disease, like you see in that picture, genital trauma. So people who ride bikes consistently can have compression in that area, liver failure, renal failure, cancer, COPD, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, and prostate cancer. So there's a lot of things that cause this, but really diabetes, low testosterone, those are going to be the most common ones. I mentioned hypertension, this is where it comes. So vascular can be hypertension and smoking can increase the risk for this. Atherosclerosis, myocardial infarction, peripheral vascular disease, damage from prostate resection or removal. That's again, why we don't just remove the prostate because you can develop this erectile dysfunction which affects the quality of life. Neurologic causes for this, it's correlated with epilepsy, stroke, Alzheimer's disease and brain and spinal cord injury medications that can cause this, antihypertensive medications and SSRIs. SSRIs are what we use to treat depression. And one of the more common side effects and the common reason for non-compliance in males with taking these medications is erectile dysfunction. 25% of all men will struggle with this and it does increase in incidence with age. On diagnostics, we wanna look at their testosterone level. You can do something called a functional evaluation where you do an injection of alprostadil into the corpus cavernosum. And if that causes an erection, we know that their anatomy works. You also wanna test a hemoglobin A1C because remember that a common cause of this is gonna be diabetes. Treatment for this, psychosexual therapy, help to treat that psychogenic cause. If the testosterone is low, we want to replace that. Phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. So Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, there's lots of them on the market. Intercavernosal vasodilator injection. That's that alprostadil that they can give in the office. The patient can also give that to themselves. And there are other ones. Vacuum devices, inflatable penile implants. That's what you see on that bottom picture there. Those can all be there to help maintain that patient's quality of life. Emergent penile disorders. They don't get their own slide because they're not that common, but they're worth mentioning. Priapism is a pathological erection. So this is not an erection due to sexual arousal. It can be high flow, which is non-ischemic. So they're still getting blood to the area or low flow, which means they're not getting blood to the area. And that can be ischemic and painful. Causes of this, erectile dysfunction drugs, sickle cell disease and leukemia because they're at higher risk for thrombosis, brain and spinal cord injury, venous obstruction from urogenital cancer, and then idiopathic. We only treat the low flow only because that's the one that's ischemic. So we can do aspiration, phenylephrine, terbutaline, and those will both increase the venous return. Penile fracture. You see this in the top picture here. The penile fracture is when uh, you have a tear in the tunica albuginea and that causes a corpus cavernosum rupture. So look at that second picture down. You can see that tear in the tunica albuginea. Causes to this or causes of this are going to be trauma to, to the erect penis. And that's usually going to be during rough intercourse. Treatment for that is to surgically fix that tunica albuginea. Fourier gangrene, this can happen in men and women, but it is much more common, 10 times more common in men. Uh, presentation, fever, intense genital pain and onset over hours. This is a rapidly progressive polymicrobial necrotizing fasciitis 
of the genital uh, and perianal anatomy. Most common cause for this, the most common aerobe is going to be E. coli. The most common anaerobe is going to be your Bacteroides species. So this can be caused by some type of anorectal infection and genital compromise or geni genital trauma with some kind of skin defect or skin compromise. On physical exam, progressive erythema and dusky skin. Dusky skin is never a good thing because that means that there is not good blood flow to that area. Purulent drainage, foul odor. When you make an incision to drain this, you have a massive amount of purulent drainage and, and the odor is definitely very specific to Fournier gangrene. Much more common in diabetics and like we said, much more common in men. We wanna treat this surgically to go in and debride the area because it's a necrotizing fasciitis. You have to get ahead of it. And then you treat it with high dose broad spectrum antibiotics. Next, we're gonna talk about our urinary and renal conditions. And these are non-gender specific. So these can be both, both male and female. We're gonna start out by talking about urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence is actually going to be more common in females because it's highly linked with childbearing. In urinary incontinence, the patient is going to present with involuntary urinary leakage, and this has a lot of social implications. So they, they, you know, they don't go out as much anymore, or they're very embarrassed, or they have to wear diapers. So there's a social aspect of this too. You want to do an exam to make sure that there's not something anatomically going on there. So in females, we'll be looking for pelvic organ prolapse, atrophic vaginitis, because this is associated in postmenopausal age, urine leakage with cough. And on males, we want to do a digital rectal exam to examine that prostate. There's really three main types of this, and that's going to be stress, urge, and overflow. But you can also have mixed. Mixed is both stress and urge. In stress incontinence, it's a stress to the abdomen. So laughing, coughing, sneezing, lifting is going to be uh, correlated with their causes of their urine leakage. Causes of this, hypermobility of the urethra due to poor pelvic support. So we have stress to that pelvic support. This is associated with estrogen loss or menopause, childbirth and hysterectomies. They just don't have the anatomy to have that pelvic support anymore. Increased abdominal pressure can cause a stress. Pregnancy, obesity, this is very common in the later terms of pregnancy. Intrinsic sphincter deficiency. So things like a prostate resection can cause this in men. Spinal cord injury, S2 through S4, and strokes. So that's stress. Urge incontinence, they have an urge to go. They have an overactive bladder detrusser muscle. So it causes this urge to go and then poof, they lose all of the urine. So they get a large volume of urine leakage. This is correlated with caffeine and diabetes. Overflow incontinence are the people that hold their urine and hold their urine and hold their urine and hold their urine. So their bladder responds by becoming larger and larger and larger. And then you lose the tone of that muscle. So it's an over distended hypotonic bladder from urinary retention. They're not peeing enough. They're holding it. Transient causes of urinary incontinence. Here's our mnemonic for this one. Um, diapers. D, delirium, infection, atropic vaginitis, diuretics, excessive, ur um, excessive urine from fluid intake or alcohol intake, restricted mobility, they cannot reach the bathroom. And then finally S, stool impaction. As they have stool impaction, we know that constipation can lead to this because it compresses the bladder. Females, like I said, are, tw are two times more common and it's 40% of women over the age of 60. Urinalysis, we want to rule out a UTI. They're having urinary leakage. And so we want to make sure we're not missing a UTI. Cough stress test, you're having them cough and then they're peeing. So that's, you're looking for urine leakage on that. You insert a cotton swab into the urethra and then you ask them to Valsalva. If you have more than a 30 degree change on this, this is called a positive cotton swab test. Urodynamic testing, this is a much more sophisticated, this is done not in just a general practice, but more of a urologist office. You're looking for the post void residual, what's left after they've voided, and then the leak point pressure, at what point, at what volume of urine are they urinating on themselves. Cystourethroscopy and um, sister urethroscopy, excuse me, and urine cytology, if they're having hematuria, because you want to make sure that they're not having cancer. For stress, we can do a penile compression device to hold that in there, a pessary 
pelvic floor rehab, things like Kegel exercises or acupuncture. They actually have specific physical therapy for pelvic floor exercises. Amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant that can help with some of these symptoms. And then something we call a bladder tack or a sacrocolpopexy. And we actually elevate the bladder and tack it back to the sacrum to try to reestablish some of that anatomy, some of that pelvic uh, support. In urge, we can do bladder training, making sure that they're going to the bathroom on a regular basis. Tricyclic antidepressants, like we mentioned, anticholinergics. There are a ton of these, Detrol, Sanctura, Vesicare, Nabilex, Levson, Toviaz, lots of those to stop that spasm and dry them out. Antispasmodics, um, Ditropan is one. Beta-3 agonists, my, uh, Mirabetric. Those are newer ones that are on the market. And then Botox, Botox in low doses can stop the spasming of the detressor muscle. If it's overflowing continence, self-catheterization, because again, they don't have the tone to that muscle to be able to contract and empty their bladder. So they may have to self-catheterize. Nephrolithiasis and urolithiasis, very, very common. These are kidney stones. For these, the patient is gonna present with colicky flank pain, meaning it comes and goes and comes and goes as that very, very sharp stone travels down the ureter. Their um, ureter or flank pain may radiate into the groin. It may cause nausea, it may cause vomiting. They may have hematuria. Why? Because it's causing little tiny tears in that ureter. They're usually restless because moving kind of helps with the pain. They may have costovertebral angle tenderness. Etiology for this, dehydration, supersaturation, they're taking too much exogenous supplementations of calcium. Um, they may also have hydronephrosis if you have an obstruction of the ureter. Here's the compositions of the stones, and this is where a lot of your exam questions will come from. The most common stone is going to be calcium oxalate, but you can also have calcium phosphate. This is going to make up 75% of all of our kidney stones. They are alkaline in nature and they are radio opaque, meaning if you take an X-ray, you can see them on the X-ray. These are highly correlated with hyperparathyroidism, hypercalcuria, and for, 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 sorry guys, ferrosamide, ferrosamide, because these increase the amount of calcium in the bloodstream. If you have a supersaturated amount of calcium in the bloodstream, that it will form stones. Struvite stones, these make up 15% of the stones. They are also alkaline. They are also radio opaque, so you can see them on x-rays. This is for people who have chronic UTIs with urease-producing bacteria, things like Proteus, Pseudomonas, and Klebsiella. Those three are really important. I'm going to say them again. Chronic UTIs with urease-producing bacteria, such as Proteus, Pseudomonas, and Klebsiella. They cause staghorn calculi. Look at that bottom picture there. It looks like a staghorn, meaning their entire renal pelvis is filled with this stone. Uric acid stones make up about 6%. They are acidic, uric acid. They are radiolucent, meaning you will not see them on x-ray, and they're associated with a high purine diet. So things like organ meats, fish, um, corn syrup, um, non-fructose or uh, corn syrup, meaning high sugar diets. And then they're also associated with people who have gout. Cysteine stones make up about 2% of stones. These are also alkaline in nature. They are radiolucent, just like the uric acid stones. And this is due to a genetic defect in cysteine resorption. So they get super saturated in cysteine and it forms the stones. So let's talk about important points and common board questions in what we just talked about. Uric acid is the only acidic stone. Calcium oxalate is the most common stone. Our two radio opaque stones are gonna be our calcium stones and our struvite stones. So those are the most commonly tested on those. About 10% of our population will get kidney stones and it starts about the age of 35 to 45. On your analysis, because those stones are causing little tiny micro tears in the ureter, hematuria. KUB x-ray, we may see those calcium stones or those struvite stones. Ultrasound is what we can use to analyze in pediatric patients and pregnant patients. And this will help us to detect stones that are larger than five millimeters, but a spiral CT is definitive. So that's gonna be the rest of the population, but we don't wanna radiate our pregnant women and we don't wanna radiate our kids. So spiral CT is the most definitive test, but if you're unsure, you can do an ultrasound on those two populations. Treatment for this, they're going to have nausea and vomiting. So we can use our antiemetics. 
IV fluids help to pass the stone, analgesics because this hurts, anti-inflammatories and sometimes even narcotics are indicated. Our treatment depends on the size of the stone. If it's under four millimeters, we can use an alpha blocker, things like Flomax or Hytrin. Urine alkali, alkali, they make the urine alkaline. Um, potassium citrate, this can dissolve the uric acid stones, but it's only use, useful for uric acid. We wanna prevent our calcium stones. We can use thiazide diuretics to do that, to keep the calcium from going out into the urine. Um, we can also use allopurinol to prevent calcium and uric acid stones. So if this is something they get on a regular basis, we want to try to prevent them in the future. If that stone is over four millimeters, there is a very low likelihood that it will pass on its own. So we can use lithotripsy. They can do a urethral stent to help it pass and open up the area or a percutaneous nephrostomy where they actually go in through the skin and remove that stone. Hydronephrosis and hydrourator. This is something where you have a backup and back pressure because the urine is unable to leave the body. So this can be a dilation of the renal pelvis or the ureter due to some kind of urinary tract blockage. This can be acute or chronic. This can be unilateral or bilateral. It can be bilateral if you have bilateral calculi or a distal obstruction, something that is downstream that backs everything up. If this patient has bilateral or a distal obstruction, they may present with anuria, no urine is being made. If they have an obstruction that's causing this, an upper obstruction like a stone can cause flank pain, a lower obstruction can cause testicular or labial pain. If it's a renal stone, bang, 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 you bang on their costovertebral angle and they will have tenderness in that area. If it is bad enough, you may have a palpable kidney on that side. Bladder distension may be present if it's a distal obstruction, so if it's an obstruction in the urethra. You also wanna do a digital rectal exam to assess the prostate in males because it may be the prostate itself that's causing this. In pediatrics, the ure uh, uretopelvic junction obstruction is the most common cause or a urethral stricture can cause this. In adults, it's gonna be renal calculi. The most common cause of, or the most common area of blockage for this is at the uretopelvic junction. Pregnancy can also cause this. In elderly, the most common cause of this is going to be BPH and pelvic cancers. Okay, so pediatrics, it's going to be an anatomical problem. Adults, it's usually going to be kidney stones. And then elderly, it's either going to be cancers or BPH. It is more common in pregnant women because the enlarged uterus will compress those ureters at the same time. And progesterone also increases the likelihood for this. Males over the age of 60 are an increased risk for this because of their higher incidence of BPH and prostate cancers. We're gonna do a urinalysis on this patient if they are making urine, and we may see hematuria if it's a renal stone. A renal ultrasound is a great initial screening test, but the CT scan is gonna be our definitive test. So remember the boards may ask you screening versus definitive, ultrasound is initial, CT is definitive. An IVP or an intravenous pilography helps us to determine the level of the obstruction because we see where all the flow stops if that CT is not definitive. We can treat this with a ureteral stent. We can do a percutaneous nephrostomy tube and you wanna treat the cause. So if it's pregnancy, you know what it is. If it's a renal stone, you also wanna treat that renal stone. If it's BPH, you treat the BPH. If it's cancers, you treat the cancers. Urinary tract infection, also called acute cystitis. This is very, 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 very common. There's a kind of a triad of symptoms for this. Urinary frequency, or, well, there's a tetrad. Frequency, urgency, burning dysuria. Frequency, urgency, burning dysuria. They may also have hematuria if it's advanced or it's been around for a while. Lower back pain is not abnormal. Malodorous uh, is not um, uncommon. Malodorous urine is not uncommon, but frequency, urgency, burning dysuria, that's kind of the, the, the uh, makeup of what we see in the history for cystitis. On physical exam, they may have suprapubic tenderness. They will not have CVA tenderness because that's only present in pyelonephritis and also kidney stones, but that's a, a good way to help us distinguish cystitis from pyelonephritis is they don't have costovertebral angle tenderness. In elderly patients with cystitis, they may also have altered mental status. 
We don't know exactly why, but we know that it interferes with the neurotransmission. So it kind of makes them go a little bit loopy. Our etiology for this, we go from uncomplicated to pyelonephritis, which now has fever, CVA tenderness, and pyuria, and then to urosepsis. In urosepsis, you have bacteremia and, and, and plus or minus end organ damage. So that's the severity, uncomplicated pyelonephritis and urosepsis. E. coli by far, 90% of the cases are going to be due to E. coli. That's because when we wipe, sometimes people wipe from back to front. Sex can transmit that from the, um, from the GI tract into the urinary tract. Staph saprophyticus is a very specific one for ages 16 to 25 for those females. Other causes that are less common, Proteus, Klebsiella, Enterococcus, and Candida. Sexual intercourse is one of the most common reasons that people get cystitis because it introduces that, that um, gastrointestinal, that E. coli into the urinary stream. Catheter use, spermicide use, vesicular uteral reflux, which is common in kids. This causes backflow of the urine. And so you get this contaminated urine that now backflows up into the body. Constipation can also enlarge the rectum and obstruct urinary flow. Sexual abuse, you need to be thinking about this. If you have somebody who has a recurrent STI that's a kid or that's elderly that is not supposed to be sexually active and you're seeing this or they have other comorbid STDs, you need to think about sexual abuse in this situation. This is very common, like I said, females ages 18 to 30 because of pregnancy and because they're sexually active. Postmenopausal female. Estrogen loss actually causes a periurethral colonization of E. coli, and you also get bladder prolapse because of into incomplete emptying. And that's usually because they've had children. They have that weak pelvic support. So postmenopausal, it's that estrogen loss and that loss of pelvic support that kind of creates this area for the urine to be stagnant in. On urinalysis, nitrites will be positive. Leukocyte esterase will be positive. They may also have hematuria. You want to run a urine culture because a lot of areas in the country are resistant to bacteria. Some areas may be resistant to Cipro. Some may be resistant to Bactrim. For our antibiotics, Bactrim is going to be one of our first lines. Macrobit or Macrodantin are going to be first line if you're pregnant. Cipro and then Cephalosporins are more of a third line. If it's due to fungal, that would be very rare, but you can use a diflucan. We also want to treat their symptoms of frequency, urgency, burning, and dysuria, and we can use that with azo or peridium. Counsel your patient that this will make their urine high, lighter orange, and it will stain everything, but it will help to treat those symptoms. Also important to counsel your patients on postcoital urination. Empty your bladder after intercourse so that you are less likely to set yourself up for transmission of that E. coli, now you have a nice environment to get this infection. Hydration is also very important. If they have catheter use, you wanna make sure that they're using sterile technique to insert that catheter. Pyelonephritis, this was the next step in that UTI. In pyelonephritis, they're gonna have all of the urinary tract, the UTI symptoms, frequency, urgency, burning, dysuria, but now they're also going to have flank pain. <clears throat> They may also have gross hematuria and systemic things like nausea, vomiting, chills. They will have a, a very high fever, over 103 typically. Costovertebral angle tenderness and suprapubic tenderness, but it's the CVA tenderness that's really important here. That means that infection has now spread up into the kidneys. So this is untreated cystitis that ascends to the renal pelvis. This can also be secondary to stone obstruction and prolonged catheter use. E. coli is gonna be the most common one of this because it's the most common cause of cystitis, but this is usually polymicrobial. So we get Proteus, Klebsiella, Enterococcus, Citrobacter, Pseudomonas, and Staph aureus. So there's a lot more causative agents for pylo, but E. coli is still by far the most common. Females ages 15 to 35 or pregnant women, because the preg and during pregnancy, that enlarged uterus pushes against the ureters and the bladder, and it causes stasis of the urine. The reason females age 15 to 35, sexually active, they may try to self-treat. They may have a urinary tract infection. They're like, oh, I'll just get azo over the counter and I'll self-treat. Well, it helps their symptoms. It doesn't help the infection. So they develop pylo because they were trying to self-treat a urinary tract infection. 
males have this kind of split between very young males, ages zero to four, and males over the age of 85, but mostly is gonna be a female related disorder. Your analysis will show pyuria. That's very important. You don't see that on cystitis. So greater than 20 high power field leukocytes. Leukocyte estrate will be positive. Nitrites will be positive because they were positive in the UTI. Gross hematuria, proteinuria. That's also very important. Greater than two, up to two grams a day of protein spilling out into the urine. Urine and blood cultures. Um, there's a test that's for pediatrics. It's not that common, but urinary neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin. This is a test in pediatrics that can help you determine this, but that's not, not, not commonly used. And then a spiral CT is going to be our definitive test for this. On, if they're an outpatient, meaning they're pretty healthy relatively, they don't have a lot of comorbids, they're not having over, you know, organ failure, IV ceftriaxone and, floral, uh, and fluoroquinolones will be our first line treatment for that. You can use Bactrim as a second line. Inpatient, meaning they're severely ill, they're pregnant, they're pediatric, they've got lots of other comorbidities. We're going to use the high dose IV antibiotics, so Unison and Zosin. In kids, they'll get AMP and Gent. That's all for our first part of this unit. I hope that you found this very helpful. If you're interested in learning more, we offer two different options. The first one um, is just to get the rest of the review video. The other is to get an exam that's correlated with this that will be very similar to what you'll see in your actual in-class or your board exam. So let me show you what those look like real quick here. The clinical pearls matching exercise, this is um, designed to be repetitive, repetitive, repetitive so that you can match the characteristics that are most commonly tested about the item to the actual answer. You can do these in a limited amount of times. We have a didactic level test that's designed to be at the level of difficulty for didactic here. There's four answer choices and it's a moderate level difficulty. This can be taken once, but anything that you have as an incorrect answer choice will be emailed to you so that you can go back and study that information. We also have a board level test, the pants or panry. This is designed to be at board level difficulty with five answer choices. And again, anything that is incorrect will be emailed to you. I wanna thank you all for watching. The, the legal part of this is that I have to say this is for educational purposes only. This is not designed to be diagnostic. I wanna thank you for watching this um, and please subscribe to our YouTube so that you can see the rest of these videos easily. And thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day.